Good morning. Welcome to worship on this gorgeous day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is Sunday, August 11th, and we're continuing our conversations about Jesus being the bread of life that comes from the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. And tonight we're going to look at, or today, uh, look at um, a particular question. And it's this question that surrounds in our opening prayer, why is Jesus called Savior of the world and bread of life? So we're going to think about what that might mean for us today. Uh, we're even going to quote, um, I'm not going to say John Wesley, because uh, there was a whole plethora of Wesleys <laughs> that helped contribute to our theology today. But we're going to quote some of that as well. But we're going to begin uh, worship this morning with the prelude, I Know Whom I've Believed. People of God said, amen. Please join me in the uh, closing, I mean opening prayer way ahead of myself this morning. Must be the cool weather. Let us pray. Who is this Jesus? Why is he called savior of the world and bread of life? He is the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He is the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. If so, then Jesus is all I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. Yes, in sorrow, Jesus is your comfort. In trouble, Jesus is your stay. And Jesus is there to tend to your every care. Thanks be to God. Amen. Be to God. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit to sing to this lily of the valley.
Please remain standing for um, our prayer for illumination, which we will pray together. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that in the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. And in the tradition of the early church, we remain standing while the good news is read. May we receive it as well as hear it. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The Jewish opposition grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They asked, isn't this Jesus, Joseph's son, whose mother and father we know? How can he say now, I have come down from heaven? Jesus responded, don't grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless they are drawn to me by the father who sent me. And I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has listened to the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. I assure you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that whoever eats from it will never die. Mm -hmm. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Mm. The word of God to the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Please be seated. <clears throat> so as I said in the greeting, there's a, that question that comes up um, in our opening prayer, and it's implied also um, in our hymn, and it's the question, who is, or why is Jesus called Savior of the world and the bread of life? Now the simple answer is, Jesus saves the world from hunger. That's the simple answer. Jesus' teachings, particularly in John, begin by building this bridge or this connection between physical hunger and spiritual hunger. So yes, Jesus is very concerned for empty stomachs and how that impacts one's ability to flourish. But Jesus is also very concerned for empty hearts that neglect to love and care for one another and neglect their faith in God's ability to provide. 
So today's lesson is no exception. We're going to look at those two things um, together. But it's also good to know that this reading, and really all of John, um, it's another one of those readings with just a multitude of lessons that we can take from it. We could talk about salvation for the faithful. Never a real popular topic. The doctrine of prevenient grace. That's the grace that we are born with no matter what we do or say. Everyone is gifted that grace. It's a fulfillment of prophecy. There's also, we could talk about God's provision for abundant living. We could go many places with this. So as is our habit at the Bible studies, we read through the scripture lesson, then we go back and we pick out what stood out for different people. So we've got all of these possibilities and different things that stand out to people, and then it's going to be good to go to our book of discipline, which I can't believe I'm quoting, but the book of discipline um, says that although Wesley, and in this particular instance, they are talking specifically about John. Although John Wesley shared with many other Christians a belief in grace, justification, assurance, sanctification, he combined them in a powerful manner to create distinctive emphasis for living the full Christian life. We don't pick out one or two and think that's it. We combine them in a powerful manner. So Wesley and Charles, Susanna, John took these words of Jesus and the whole of Scripture and combined it with current context to reveal God's ability to satisfy the world's hunger. And Christ, it is Christ who is revealed through these lessons of grace and faith and life. And so we're not going to make any, uh, delve into kind of any definitive statements um, about salvation through grace. Uh, specifically, no one um, comes to the Father unless they're, or comes to me unless they're drawn. No one. Um, but we're also going to talk about what struck me in particular reading this scripture um, this week. And this is the one that st stood out for me. Don't grumble among yourselves. <laughs> no one can come to me unless they are drawn to me by the Father who sent me. So again, not so much about the no one as much as it was this idea about being drawn to God, drawn to Jesus by God. So I wanted, I explored what that might mean and what that might look like. One commentator went so far as to suggest that we are wooed, invited, even cajoled by God to come to Jesus. And I had to think about that one. And then I remembered, this church has an amazing evangelist. And she told me one time that she has invited, wooed, even cajoled, about 100 people to come to church. And maybe only a couple have come. But I think it's remarkable. She's never given up. And she uses that ability to relate to people, to invite them to Jesus. So we've got that idea about being drawn to God. Now let's look at the rest of the text. So Jesus, again, is referring to himself as the bread of life, the human one who came down from heaven for the hunger of the world. Physical hunger, yes but mostly this deep and abiding hunger for the word of God to bring grace and peace, hope and reassurance to people who did not have that. All these things we learn from Jesus. Not so much in word, but in how he witnessed. 
So again, if we simplify that Jesus is the bread of life, it will save one's life. It saves us from uh, physical death when our physical needs are met because we love and care for one another and no one goes without need, uh, want. And saves us from this spiritual death when we're disconnected or displaced from this love of God. Now when I see this image in my head of bread of life, I, you know, big, warm, crusty loaf of bread. There's plenty back there if you'd like to take some home. Not so much warm. You're going to have to warm it up yourself. It's a nice piece of flat bread that you can use to soak up a soup. My mom and I, we host family di dinner quite often. And I can't imagine how it would go over if we did not serve a warm loaf of Joseph's Farm Market bread down in Naples. Go after lunch, because the bread's still warm and fresh. But what if that bread wasn't actually a loaf of bread? What could it mean spiritually? What aspect of God is so central to our faith, we can't imagine how it would go over not to partake of it every day? Certainly every family dinner. Any thoughts? Love? Nourishment? Lo Ooh. How about grace? Grace is our bread. Grace feeds the hunger of the world. And maybe that's why we don't come to Jesus on our own. We are drawn to Jesus through grace. The Apostle Paul says that we're saved by grace alone. Nothing we can do saves us. It's by grace alone. Grace draws us to the light, awakens us, opens our eyes and softens our hearts. And we have nothing to do with this amazing gift. It is God who is the gifter, the one who energizes our hearts and minds, like the energizer bunny. So then how do we respond to this attraction to grace? By being witnesses, evangelists, Curious folks who open, are open to the power of the way that grace draws us to Jesus. We are witnesses to a life of love and kindness and nourishment and patience, gentleness, self-control, all of those seven fruits of the Spirit. When we live as ones drawn to the light, people around us see a difference. We don't have to be eloquent interpreters or proficient in quoting scripture. We simply must witness to our faith in a way that says we, are, we share, we love, we assist, we give, and we do this often without saying a word. St. Francis of Assisi, Preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. It's what the Wesleys did for us. John, Charles, Susanna. Preach the gospel at all times. They also believe that God bestows this grace on every single child of God, every single one. Believers and non-believers, black folk and white, Republicans and Democrats, any polarized opposite ever imagined, God's gift of grace is there, offered without price, accepted without cost. That is the grace that draws us to Jesus. 
and some people gravitate to it right away. Others grumble and reject the offer. These are stories, and there are plenty, about people who grumbled and rejected the rigors and the cost of accepting grace as a way to know Jesus. And there's all kinds of reasons why. We talked about them at Bible study. It threatens one po one's power. It contradicts some beliefs that we hold dear. Joshua Timmy said that um, it disturbs all the fundamentals. Now, whatever reason there is for accepting this idea of grace, this idea of there being a spiritual nourishment that satisfies um, us so much that it is sufficient to feed the world. I think it was Martin Luther King Jr. who said, um, it's not that we don't have the way, we don't have the will to feed people all over the world. John Newton was another prime example. Employed as a slave trader, he participated firsthand in the cruelty of humankind. He resisted grace and opted for what didn't threaten his power or his wealth. And then one day he writes, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. When John Newton penned those words, he was mired in a load of guilt and shame. Yet, drawn by God through amazing grace, to the satisfying salvation of Jesus Christ. He found a new life and an abundant space in his heart to not only accept forgiveness, but to love and be loved. So I think that's why this idea of Jesus being the bread of life or the bread being the gift of grace or God's ability to offer hope even in the midst of the most despicable of human beings is how the world's hunger is satisfied. And how do we know that? Because we are witnesses to that truth. We have found the recipe for the secret sauce that feeds heart, mind, and soul. And so our task is to share that witness through living lives that emulate peace and justice, reconciliation, unity, hope. At Tuesday night's National Night Out, I was, I was so proud of Covenant. We not only hosted the event, um, but there were as many folks from Covenant there as there were people from the neighborhood. And we learned about the importance of being registered to vote and the importance of having a plan on how to get there and vote, whether in person or absentee. Annette uh, Ramos, who's the director of the Monroe County Board of Elections, <clears throat> an energetic witness for why it's so important that people are informed and diligent in their voting. So this very idea of living lives of peace and justice and reconciliation seem, if they do seem a little bit too big to handle, all you have to remember is show up, participate, and have a plan. How does God draw us to Jesus, the Savior of the world and the bread of life? It's because he's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, the fairest of 10,000 to our souls. The timeless, eternal answer 
is that we are drawn here only by God's grace, and we are fed a nourishment that extends into eternity. Amen. Lord of life and love, we stand here only by your grace. We have been gifted with um, a plethora of titles for Jesus this morning. Bread of life, lily of the valley, bright and morning star. And our prayer hymn um, does the same thing for God gives us all sorts of images and that there is just no end, even in eternity, to the way that we can praise with names.
Before we get to praying God, the sculptor of the mountains, let me give you um, our updates and prayer lists. It is long. Get, get out your pencils. Um, and, um, or see either Anne or, or me later if you want a list, because um, I know that it helps for your weekly, weekday prayers to have names. Um, we pray for our own uh, Chris Duran, who's um, recovering from surgery and then managed to fall and broke her wrist. So we want a special prayers for Chris and for Val continuing to recover from foot surgery. And for a friend of mine, Kathleen, who will have foot surgery following a car accident um, this week. That's Kathleen. We pray also for Cheryl's granddaughter's uh, friend. Um, Cheryl, Cheryl's granddaughter's name is Ty, and um, some of you have met her already. Um, and she's asking for a friend, for prayers for her friend who has been diagnosed with cancer. We continue to pray for Josh's son and David and his family. Uh, for Patsy, who um, is Kathy Langkamp's cousin, um, r recovering from cancer surgery. Uh, Christina asked for prayers for the family of Fran Carson, who passed away. Fran is a relatively new discovered relative of Christina's. Um, Margaret Ann is asking, I mean, Margaret Ann Milm, <laughs> is asking for prayers um, for her cousin, Ginny, who is in hospice. We also pray for uh, Darlene's sister, Peggy, who um, we know and love, but who um, is um, needing, the whole family is needing our prayers. Um, and for our um, doctor in residence, <laughs> um, Aaron, who will have a major exam coming up on Wednesday, the 14th. Um, our friend, Anne and I's friend, um, Cindy, uh, is still in hospice at um, Strong. And um, this week we also prayed for a young man, um, Ben. And we ask for prayers again for him. He's the nephew of um, one of our online um, attendees, um, Betsy. So, a deep breath in as we breathe in the spirit and the grace and breathe out as we turn all of them over to God, the sculptor of the mountains. Sculptor of the mountains, jeweler of the stars, we come to you this morning, some of us rich in your grace and some of us empty and depleted, but all of us needing form and substance and purpose that only you can create. We are grateful for the beauty of the earth for our relationships, our church community, and all of your gifts of grace. But we admit too that we are messing up your creation, depleting Earth's resources, damaging ecosystems right and left, and we too need to be remade in your image by your love. We pray especially this week for those who are being harmed by a hurricane or flood. Potter of the earth and of our hearts, shape us as your creation is shaped by your hands. Companion on the journey we are deeply aware of our own hubris and greed and that of our nation. 
but we also are aware of our loneliness and hunger and thirst for the bread of life that is justice and peace through grace. Lead us with your presence. Nurture us with the bread of life, the food of love, so we may become co-shapers of the world into your beloved community. Healer of broken places, we bring to you all the brokenness of our own lives and of those we love and the places of warfare and dreadful suffering we see only at a distance on TV. We pray for Mark's soul upon the death of his best friend, for Chris and Val, for Ty and her friend, for David and his family, for Patsy, for Ginny, for the grieving family of Fran Carson. We pray for Aaron, especially as he prepares for Wednesday, for Peggy and Darlene's whole family, for Cindy and Kathleen and Ben, Sculptor of our hearts, renew us again with your spirit of joy and creativity and strength for the journey given by grace. We offer these heartfelt prayers in the spirit of Jesus, the bread of life, who dared to call you creator of the cosmos, our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. As we prepare for our time of giving to God, a reminder for those of you watching online, if you go to our website, covenantroc.org, there's a safe and secure giving portal uh, donate button uh, where you can um, give to God through that as well. Um, we do have a reading that we've been reading as we go through this, these six weeks of, uh, or five weeks, I guess, um, through the chapter 6 of John, and it goes like this. We give in grateful thanksgiving for all that God has given us. In the upside-down world of the gospel, we measure our wealth not by what we have, but by what we give away. Let us give away generously in this offering to bless your church, your people, and your creation. Amen. Our announcements uh, this morning, we have Reading on the Rock, Mary, Mary Lupian, if, you're, if you watch anything going on in our neighborhood or in, uh, um, it's not Congress, what is she, she's, City Council, I knew it started with the C, and she has come to read the story about Eleanor, uh, Quiet No More, The Life of Eleanor Roosevelt, that'll air tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. DeWitt Johnston, um, you know, passed away back in May. Um, he's been at the Dearna Funeral Home since then. We've been trying to get uh, authorization from the county to provide him a burial, and we finally received that. So we are going to meet a Tuesday at 1 o'clock at Whitehaven, at the main gate at Whitehaven, 1 o'clock, and process in, and DeWitt will have already been buried um, and we will um, bless his uh, resting place. So if you would like to join, um, that's one o'clock Whitehaven on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday. We've also um, 
incurred some expense for this burial, despite having the burial plot donated from our friends at the Fairport Church. Um, but if you would like to make a contribution to go toward these burial costs, namely the headstone, if you want to make a gift to the pastor's discretionary fund, those gifts will go toward um, DeWitt's expenses. And we have um, a new-to-you sale. This is the uh, new-to-you sale eve, um, the, the, the day before our week of putting it all together. Uh, we already have two antique dressers in the, ba in the um, Palmer room by the elevator that are for sale early. They're yours for $30 each. Save us from having to take them downstairs. And you guys got a great dresser. But we're going to watch a video, a shortened video of, um, of what that will happen this week. Our new to you sale is this week, and the action starts today after worship. Those who are able can help set up tables in the fellowship hall and bring out the stuff from various rooms in the basement. Tuesday night at 5.30, we'll have a pricing party with pizza, when we'll sort through and price items. Setup continues the rest of the week. Bring donations between now and Thursday, and place those items on the tables in the right categories. The sale starts Friday at 9 a.m., and we need plenty of volunteers to make sure things go smoothly at the opening, especially with security and checkout. On Saturday, we'll give away what's left on Good Neighbor Day between 9 and noon. Hopefully, there won't be a lot left, but there likely still will be some stuff to pack up and haul away. So, help out the church, help out your neighbors by donating to and volunteering with our New to You sale. Awesome. So, as Bob was saying, we do need those volunteers on Friday, well, all week to help set up, but particularly Friday morning when we first open, and Saturday, um, the, the sale, or not the sale, but the giveaway, the Good Neighbor Day, um, that pretty much runs itself until about 11.30 when we start packing up the items that um, are clearly not going to be um, taken away and then take them to another charity. So those are the two times, Friday morning for sure, for probably three hours, and then um, Saturday morning around 11, uh, 12 o'clock would be awesome. So we have much to be grateful for and much to praise God as we uh, sing praise God from whom all blessings flow. Good and gracious God, we thank you for all that you have given us. And so bless these gifts to be used to build about just um, an amazing place that shares and witnesses to your gift of grace. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I invite you to, be, to remain standing for our closing hymn, God Be With You Till We Meet Again. It's in the red hymnal number 672.
So as we go forth from here, we go forth to witness to the lily of the valley, the bright morning star, the fairest of 10,000 to our souls. I invite you to be seated for um, the, ben, uh, the postlude, The Lily of the Valley. And together the people of God say, Amen. Amen.